Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Ed. I'm the head of product at Depop. Uh, hands up if you know of Depop. I would explain it, but much simpler is going to be showing you this video, which was very kindly put together by our people department. There's no sound, unfortunately. That's it. <laughs> it all, it's, it's slightly more dramatic with the sound, I'll give you that. But there's a lot of numbers there which I thought would be slightly more interesting with people. These are all users from our site, by the way. We don't use any models in our advertising. They're all people who are buying and selling stuff on our site. So yeah, we're, we're a social fashion marketplace, um, sometimes described as if you took Instagram and eBay and just like mashed those together. Uh, our sellers go to a lot of trouble to style the items that they're selling. So you can see these, these images here. These are like typical images you'll find on the site. It doesn't look like other marketplaces, and that's a big attraction for, for people that come to us. I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about sort of like theories of personalization or anything like that. I'm going to talk you through three case studies of things we've done recently to improve the personalization on our site. So Depop is already quite a personal experience because it's social. So the people that you follow and what they're posting then makes it very personal for you, just in the same way that Instagram is based on who you're following there. So my Depop will not look the same as yours. But beyond that, we're looking at ways we can make it even more personal, even faster. First one of these uh, case studies we call the Style Wizard. So during the onboarding process, we capture people's uh, email addresses, the password, a username, sort of basic information like this. But then straight away we put them into this sort of screen, uh, which is our style wizard, where we have about 30 images, different styles, which we ask people just to tap the ones that they like. Now based on those, we can basically match them against some sellers that we think they'll like. Now if you imagine that we have like, tens of thousands of sellers on our, on our platform, if you're coming in and you don't know where to start, that, that's a real problem. So this is a way of getting past that kind of cold start problem and giving people some content on the site to look at straight away. I've, I've kind of indexed the numbers here just so you can see the, the uplift, but when we did an A-B test on this, so like comparing people who got no Star Wizard versus those who we, who we gave those seller recommendations to, you can see that the, like, all the numbers went up and quite a lot. So saves, this is the number of items being saved. This is effectively um, adding items to basket on another site because we, we don't have a basket. So this is saving an item uh, for later. Actual purchases, so number of transactions or number of items being bought. And follows is just the number of sellers that people are following. So you can see all of these jump significantly in the first seven days by personalizing the recommendations of the sellers that we can, we can give to people. So this kind of like first case study here. For, for people that are sort of existing users, uh, already on the site, um, something we've also tried uh, recently is our For You section. So you can, you can see it just here. So this page is our Explore page. It's like our browse experience. And up until about a month ago, it was all curated content. So the sellers that we put at the top here, these are all picked by us and, and our internal team. And likewise, there's, a, there's sort of like an infinite scroll here, not quite infinite scroll, but 250 items per market that we hand curate to show sort of the best of Depop. And that's great, but it was the same for every person. And what we've done recently is add in this For You section. So the way that we find these items, so these are item recommendations rather than shops, is we basically take people who've liked at least 10 items, and we find uh, sort of other, other users on the platform who've liked 
at least two of the same items as them. And then for those other users that they, they're similar to, we look for the items that they've liked, but the original users haven't, and show those items to the original users. Hopefully that makes sense. Ask me later if not. And, and that gives us some personalized item recommendations that we, we can be fairly sure that you'll like. So they go in there, and users typically get sort of 50 to 100 items that they'll see there. You can see that this is, so this is like just the number of interactions. And th this is a mixed basket of actions of people opening the product, of chatting to the seller, of liking it, saving it, buying it. We've bundled those all together um, because they give you a mixed basket of engagement. This blue line here, this is the amount of engagement we were getting from all our users on this page um, going forwards. And this red line coming up here is what we're seeing from this section here as we add it. So you can see this, this is a significant amount. It's about 60% of the blue line. So there's quite a lot of engagement coming from those personalized recommendations. That 60% is probably even more impressive if I tell you that only 40% of our users can actually see that because uh, they like enough items. And only 10% are clicking on this See All button at the moment and actually seeing the full list of items that we've recommended them. And that's because this is still really a test. This was like our first MVP that we launched. And we were already increasing the amount of engagement on one of our main pages by 60%. So third case study I'm going to talk about is our activation emails. So the Star Wizard, the For You section, these are quite heavyweight personalization techniques that are run by our data science team. It takes them sort of you know, from, from scratch months to come up with the algorithms that will work on those, make them ready for production, get them scalable, and then release them. But we've also been looking at much more simple things that we can do with much, much fewer data points. And one of them is this activation email. So whenever someone signs up, about a week after they join, we send them an email, and we just show them some products that are on Depop. Now, that used to be sort of just some items that we thought they might like. But we recently started trying out personalizing that, depending on what we'd seen them search for in the app. And we initially started searching uh, or testing that uh, and categorizing users basically, had they searched for vintage, uh, which is a big category for us, or had they searched for particular brands, so in this case, Nike and Tommy Hilfiger. And then if they did any one of those searches, we'd basically personalize that email. So if they search for vintage, we'd send them a selection of vintage sellers. If they search for Nike, we'd send them a selection of Nike items. And the same for, for Tommy Hilfiger. And you can see like, the, the conversion rate, so the, the number of people who are then coming back to the site and buying something jumps dramatically when we personalize that email for the stuff that they've actually been looking for, as you sort of might, might imagine. But it's also, that's quite a a simple tactic for, for us to, to do. Um, the, the comment on this, like, and, you know, why is there such a big difference between Nike, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Vintage? This is something we need to dig into more. But our hypothesis is that actually for, for Tommy Hilfiger, there's a far lower number of people uh, searching for that. That's why the, the, kind of, the base conversion is also low, because there's fewer people selling that, fewer people buying that. There's items for people to find there. So when we can really personalize that, that's quite a specific recommendation then. So you're then seeing a really big increase in the conversion. Whereas something like Nike, like, there's lots of items there. There's lots of stuff to find. Lots of people are searching for it. So recommending Nike items to people is, is less personal to them. It's less, less specific. Those are the three case studies, like things that we've tried in the, in the past few months. Um, some kind of general thoughts to, to wrap that together. Like, Personalization is super effective. Everything that we've tried so far has had a really big impact on the numbers, uh, as you've seen. And um, uh, point two would be like, yeah, the basis for the suggestions. If I quick, click quickly back here, one of the points in the discussion was, you know, when does personalization get creepy? Or like, when does it feel kind of a little bit off? And that hasn't been a problem for us, because for both the Star Wizard and for you, where we're doing these more powerful personalization techniques, you can see we're being very clear sort of like where those recommendations are coming from. So here we say, you know, this is based on what you like. And people therefore understand if they're not liking stuff or if they've been liking kind of a weird basket of things, they'll get slightly off recommendations. Or if they've been liking a particular type of style and they get those recommendations, they understand where that's coming from. 
And that's been really successful for us in the terms of we, we get a lot of people commenting on how much they like the personalization, and very few people commenting that the recommendations seem off or they don't like them. Third point here, um, as I mentioned briefly and for you, is there's a huge amount of potential for us anyway to both improve both the adoption and the effectiveness of these measures. So obviously, the more information we have about our users, the better recommendations we can do. But uh, a lot of our, our, or like some of our users, aren't as engaged as others. So now that we've got like this, this benchmark or this kind of starting point of recommendations for 40% of people, um, and 10% of them are opening that for you section, we can do quite a lot to drive that up and give recommendations even if they're not quite as good recommendations, we don't know quite as much to more of our users and make them more likely to open that section. And effectiveness as well. Like those recommendations, we can improve the machine learning algorithms, but we can also apply some basic filters to the recommendations we're giving people, filtering by size, filtering by gender. Um, there's lots of, of kind of also things that we can do there that we expect to improve the effectiveness and drive the engagement numbers and the sales numbers up even further. That was my kind of three case studies. Um, so we're now moving on to the discussion part. Or I'm looking, or do we do some questions first? My on. Um, it's, at this point, everyone should be debating the discussion points at their tables. That's going to go on for about 15 minutes, at which point um, Ed will uh, bring it back to the stage and we'll ask some of you to feedback your points and then you'll sum up, if that's okay with you. Fine by me. Great. Cool. Okay. So I think we're going to wrap up the individual table discussions there and have a more kind of group discussion amongst all of us. Um, I saw this fairly open, so I'll, I, I may pick on tables later. But firstly, who had a really good discussion? Hands up. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And maybe we'll go for this table here then. What, what did you discuss? Tell us what it was. What were your insights? We've got a mic coming over. Hi, I'm, I'm Rob from Presto Music. Uh, we've, got, we've got a large product base and a very picky customer base. And we don't do, essentially, we don't do any personalization at the moment, and we want to, but we want to do it right and not piss off those customers. Mm. And we're very well known for our editorial content that if we recommend something, they can trust that it would be good. And I suppose the worry is if we're recommending something through some AI or through some, well, other people happen to have clicked on this and it gets it wrong, we don't want to ruin that reputation. So although we want to do it and we're not saying it's a bad thing, it's, it's something we're treading carefully and want to make sure we do it right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely up. sympathize with that. Do you want to add in? No? no? <laughs> I think it's, um, it's particularly jarring when you get recommendations that are feeling off base, right? Yeah. Um, is this, this table, oh, <laughs> someone else. There was uh, one other thing that we, we sort of discussed and that there are actually additional dimensions to, per, to personalization that, that become important, not least that the retailer may have a, a sort of a personalization agenda in that, that they may have things with a particularly high margin, they may have stuff that's sitting on the shelves mm. that need to shift, they may actually be taste brokering, i.e thinking about what the next big thing might be before the data is there, to, you know, introducing these, uh, these products into the marketplace. Uh, and I think we added that as a little additional dimension to our discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that actually uh, echoes something I heard over from this table, Glenn. Hello. Um, sorry, yeah, I quite selfishly took our discussion off at a bit of a tangent because I didn't want to just talk about recommendations being personalization because for me, personalization is way more than just product recommendations. It should be everything else about the, the intent of the person as they come to the site, everything you know about them, whether that be elevating different things on the page, whether that be presenting messaging different, etc. So I just want to make sure we just didn't talk about product recommendations, but I think it's a bit of a losing battle so far. 
Yeah, I mean, I think like we, I talked about basically personalizing content, but you can also personalize the entire structure of your of your website and your experience, whatever that whatever that is. Who else had any thoughts they wanted to share, or perhaps this big table in the middle? Yeah. Hi, there's, oh wow, that's quite loud, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Salvatore Pendino from uh, Dunhumby, we're part of Tesco. Um, so personalization is quite a big thing for us um, with all the big data conversations and the buzzword bingo. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's um, to echo the point that was uh, made by the um, gentleman here on the table next to us. I guess it's kind of balancing the uh, retailer and supplier's objectives, um, commercial objectives, with the experience for the customer. So one of the, the fundamental things with Tesco and Dunhumby is putting the customer at the heart of the decision making. And it is something that you hear a lot of businesses talk about, but we kind of take strides to make sure that is always happening. Now, when you need to balance that with commercial objectives, there's always considerations around, you know, what is going to generate revenue, what's going to make a platform profitable, um, how are we going to get that balance right between personalization and hyper personalization where it's actually going too far down the funnel and it's trying to be too predictive um, and getting it right with just having the right sort of touch points and media conversations at the right point in the customer journey. So almost letting customers engage without even realizing it. So making it part of their customer journey, making it frictionless, making it feel like it's part of the website, for example, you don't necessarily need to personalize in that capacity. If you have that understanding of how customers are shopping in general, you just need to make sure that you're tailoring your messaging wherever they, that customer is. Um, and the trend we see increasingly is that it's the, the channel isn't really the only thing anymore. It's the audience that you need to talk about mm. and how that customer engages. I think there's a good point made in one of the other, um, the other talks earlier around the hybrid nature of interacting with technology. And it's not all about voice. It's not all about mobile. Um, you know, we still see customers converting their orders on desktop devices, even though desktop isn't really flavor of the month um, anymore. So I think it's just getting that balance right on that scale of monetization and media um, and revenue and also making customers feel that they, you know, are having a valuable experience on the platforms. Absolutely. I think we need to wrap up there. So thank you very much for your thoughts. Um, and I'll hand back.